Emily Kaplan, how are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me. I was laughing to myself today thinking about this podcast. I, I always slightly, like someone said to me, they always think I'm, I'm better when I don't prep, but I always prep some because I want to make sure I don't say any really dumb things. And the one thing that occurred to me is I wondered if people would be surprised that we're friends. I definitely, I have had people say to me like, how do you guys know each other? And I'm like, well, we sat next to each other at a dinner at the games last year. I mean, this is not my version. You should tell yours. And we didn't agree on a lot of things, but we, I think, walked away with a mutual sense of respect for each other, for holding our ground on things and agreeing to disagree, but also agreeing that like we understood each other's side. That makes sense. And then since then, I think like you've sent me a bunch of stuff and that's been relevant and interesting and I've been appreciative of all of that. And I mean, I think in some ways, a lot of one of the sort of not misunderstandings, but like one of the things that people don't necessarily realize about me is that I've been involved doing CrossFit myself for a long time, but I haven't been like a diehard, like I'm not a huge game girl fan. I, I don't follow any of that really. I was always interested in it from the sort of health side. So I've really appreciated people who have welcomed me, if that makes sense. And I think like you didn't welcome me. <laughs> Dinner right. was easy, right? But it was, I appreciated that you were talking to me so openly about things that you were concerned about, right? And that you didn't know that you had, this, that you had questions about. That's the name of the game, right? I think the more that people can be open to discussion, which I think leads into the, sort of how you've explained the show to me, the better off we all are. We don't have to agree. In fact, like it's far more interesting when we don't. And I just think, I think we became friends after that, even though we didn't agree on everything because we were both, we have strong opinions and it's kind of interesting to talk to somebody who has a different side of the story. You always learn from that person if you're open to it. Well, Del King brought us together. I think we both agree he's a sexy beast, right? Like that's, that's an easy thing to agree upon. Why are you talking about our friends? Because we both think Dale's a sexy beast. Yeah, because we both love Dale. Who doesn't love Dale? That's a better answer. Yeah, everybody loves Dale. No, it was funny. First of all, I don't remember disagreeing with you on much stuff at that dinner, but I, admittedly, I think I had a few drinks. Uh, and I say a lot of dumb shit when I'm drinking. I remember Dale invited me, obviously, and I, and I didn't know you were going to be there. And I only knew you through the CrossFit book Instagram page. So it was... It was, I don't know, surprising isn't the right word. It was just like, all right, well, this is interesting, something different. And then we sat right next to each other and that was fun for me. Like, I love getting to know people. And I, I, I often get accused of living in an echo chamber, but it's actually kind of the opposite. Like, I, I like learning other people's opinions. Even if I don't agree, I think it's fun to find out what makes people tick and, and what gets them excited and why they're excited about it. My uh, mom and dad were always kind of that way. I, I come from a really, really uber conservative family, but they're always really inquisitive. Mm -hmm. And I think that rubbed off on me at an early age and I just kind of always held on to it and it's served me well for whatever that's worth. Well, I mean, I think it's necessary and I think it's missing from the current value system. I mean, I think it, our differences is what makes us that sort of, as I said before, interesting. I also think you fall in love with somebody's vulnerabilities, not their strengths, right? And so if people are unwilling to expose vulnerability or talk about, ask questions about things that they don't know completely, right? Or be self-confident enough to recognize that you are, we're all living in our own echo chambers, right? Like we're all living in, as much as we try to get out of it, we make a conscious, conscious effort to do that. The likelihood is you're still within some parameter of that same centric system. And so I think it's hugely important. I mean, I think I've said this on another podcast, but I think I was definitely raised. My mom taught us that it was really important to ask questions because it was, we were showing you were listening. You can't ask a good question if you haven't been listening to what the person said. And so she had lots of dinner parties and as kids, we had to sit through those dinner parties. My mom would be like, Emily, what do you want to ask so-and-so? And it was like, you better feel that one. Was that painful? Okay. Was that painful for you as a kid? Like your parents forcing you to do that? It wasn't. I mean, I think like it was, it was sort of like kind of hard to explain. It was just how it always was. I mean, my mom also really encouraged a lot of debate in our family and it would get brutal. And if you started crying or something, she would say, 
you're losing, you're arguing from emotion, you've lost the facts of the, of the argument, you, and you start crying, you've lost. So, I mean, she was tough, but she was right. And I think we see that all the time now where people lead with emotional arguments. And it's, right. that's not the right way to actually have a conversation about issues. Right. That's so interesting to me. I was raised almost the opposite with a father who, to this day, I mean, he's 80 now, he's about to turn 80, is still convinced he's right about everything. Right. There's no topic in which he is not correct in. So we had kind of the opposite experience. There was no debate. It was kind of his way or, or that way. And I say that with love in case he watches this for some reason. Like it, it was never offensive to me. It was just a different mindset. And I think I, as I got older, I took a, maybe a different tact of saying, all right, I, I've seen that side of it. Maybe I need to listen to other people and at a minimum, just try to understand it, even if I didn't agree with it. Well, and make up your own mind, right? And not just like her. I mean, I think in some ways it's not one extreme or the other isn't good. And I think in the way that I was brought up, there was a lot of, you don't talk, like emotion is not part of the equation. And surely right. emotion is a part of the equation, right? So you have to find, you have to work that in on your own because that's not part of how you win or lose the dinner conversation. And people operate off of emotion. So you can't actually, this isn't actually a formal bait of life. Right. Do, do you keep this same kind of mindset with your kids? Do you have to do the dinner parties and they have to ask the questions or do you? I, I mean, I'm pretty strict with them about sort of social engagement and like how you handle things, but uh, not to that. And I think it's, I also, as somebody who obviously was a journalist and really values the fourth estate and thinks it's essential. Like my dad read the wall street journal at breakfast every morning to us and ask us questions about what we thought about what was going on in the world at my mom would make dinner while McNeil Lair was on. And so we had a lot of information coming at us and we don't watch the news now. I hate the local news. I think it's all about fear. I have so much stuff on the news that I feel like my kids aren't really, I mean, my son is at a point now where he's really, actually be really interested in like politics and foreign affairs and history and wars. And so that he can be really fun to talk to about that stuff. But it's, I, it's actually been really interesting to me how my daughter doesn't really know geography. And I think part of that is we don't really talk about the world in like this place is here and this. Is the, and so right. I think we need to do more of that. But as far as debate, I mean, I think we all have strong personalities in this family and we did in mine growing up. And so there is a lot of challenging and sporty. Are you finding, are you, you mentioned your kids are 10 and 12. Are you, are you finding them to start formulating their own opinions at that young age already? Oh my God. They came out having strong opinions. That has not been a problem. The opposite. I kind of joke that like, I want them to challenge authority and I want them to have strong opinions, except with me. What I yeah, say I'm yeah. challenged, right? Yeah, no, I get that. I, I kind of the same. It's not a problem. I'm, I'm actually incredibly proud of, of what strong independent opinions, both of my daughters have had, and they're wildly different from mine and from their mother. And I love that about them, but there are times when I'll say something, like I said, something to my youngest other day and she sighed at me and I'm like, don't do that. Don't have such a strong opinion. You just think I'm an idiot. Come on, talk it out. So it's just funny as you watch your kids age and grow and become their own people and form their own opinions. There's the, the balance between you. You want to change their mind as the, the debater and you wants to change their mind, but there's the other side of you as a parent that you just want to hug on and say, this is fantastic. You know? Right. Right. And it's cool when they can also show you stuff. I mean, I it's different, but I try to take the kids on a trip every year just so we have some alone time, just me and them a lot. And and my, a couple of years ago, I took my son to New York and I lived in New York for a while. So I know the city really well. And so we went to Lion King and it was over at 11, which was very late for him. Right. And so I was like, okay, we're going to go to bed. And in the morning you can play your iPad, a big deal. And I'm going to sleep. And he was like, actually, mom, I really, I got this book out of the library. He was probably eight, nine with the library, like the library of school, right. About New York. And I want to go to the High Line. Because a kid figured out that there were these old railroad tracks and everything had been grown over and now they've turned it into this garden and you can walk. And I had my teacher look and she said that you can actually get coffee up there. So I thought it'd be really cool if we went 
and had, you could have coffee and watch the sunrise. And it was like, it's one of my happiest moments, like as a mom, as a person, because it was like, I love traveling, but I usually plan everything for everybody when I've traveled a lot. So I can sort of say, oh, these are the things that I love to do in the city or whatever. So for him to offer an idea of his own, that was an awesome idea that I hadn't thought of, right? I had actually never been up on the high line before. And we went and did it and we, had the, we walked the whole thing. And we, it was amazing. So I feel like that's probably a little bit like having an older child who's formulated a well-thought-out opinion that's different than yours, doesn't agree with you, but you have so much respect for how she's come there. That's sort of how I felt about us doing the high line. I was like, this is fucking awesome. You know what I mean? That is awesome. In the show. Okay. Yeah. No, we swear a lot. I, I definitely <laughs> swear a lot. I, I feel like I've lived three or four lifetimes at this point with my girls as they've aged, like going through what you're describing and then now kind of where they are in their journey. And it feels like it's about to take another turn as they're getting close to getting out of college. That's a, right. a, a really weird dynamic aging and watching your kids become adults and the pride that comes with that, but then also the sadness that everything that's behind you is not coming back. Yeah. I think, I think that's why people get so excited to be grandparents probably. Yeah. Knuckle, knuckle what I won't be one anytime soon. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to talk some about the broken science initiative. Obviously Dale put that on my radar, which is how we met. And, and obviously through the CrossFit book, I started to see that start to, to leak out. So I guess I d just wanted to start with a little bit of your journey. Like, how did you find yourself here? So involved with obviously the, the work that Greg's been doing and, and, and leading that initiative. Well, so, I mean, I think to go back to that, it, Greg and I had both been looking at sort of what we would say is like the ills of modern medicine for on our own. I mean, at this point, both of us were about 20 years and we had both sort of looked very carefully at nutrition. So I knew Gary 20 plus years ago when he was still, he hadn't written good calories, bad calories yet. And, and I actually interviewed him in his apartment in New York with like cats crawling all over him. And so a long time ago. So by the time that I met Greg, which was probably like 2017, I, think, I had been doing, I had done a lot of work into a lot of the things that he was also really curious about. And Tom Seafried, the guy who's the cancer has a metabolic disease author and researcher is the one who introduced it. And so we kind of had, it was like one of these funny things where you meet somebody who has been looking at everything that you've been looking at and it's, you're playing the name. Oh, do you know so-and-so? And are you familiar with this work? And oh my God, what about this? And the thing that's interesting is that I wasn't familiar with a lot of the stuff that he had done. So I didn't know about the NSCA case. I didn't know that he had successfully sued CDC. And so it was and there was a lot of stuff that I had done. Like he didn't know a lot of the stuff that I was looking at with women's health. And so there was, a, we could also bring things to the table that the other one didn't know about. And he was in the process of sort of coming up with the idea for CrossFit Health and then launching that. And so I went to the, I was part of the first MDL1 group, even though I'm not a doctor, but he had me come out for that, which was great. And he came to Boston a bunch of times. So I went to Harvard Business School with him several times and went on hospital tours with him here. And we really just sort of developed a friendship through this common interest and like mission. I mean, I think we're both pretty mission driven and things were getting worse. They weren't getting better. Right. And I think we could both see that. And then when he was called a racist, I was working on a big, a big story that was going to be like a long feature length story that I'd been working on for a long time about the NSCA case. And he was calling me and he was saying like, what should I do? And I was like, I think you need to explain the tweet, right? I think nobody gets that we're actually doing the opposite of being racist because nobody bothered to look into the quote that he had that went along with Floyd 19, which was really from a journal of infectious disease. And it was a retrospective piece that went from plague through H1N1. And it described quarantine as a tool of segregation. So his point with Floyd 19, which he tweeted at the IHME, which is a modeling organization that had been modeling all the COVID stuff, which was what the politicians had relied on to justify lockdown. And Greg had known through the beginning that basically their math was wrong, that we didn't have denominators. We knew that there was no way we could have a death rate. We didn't have the right figures yet to make any projections. 
So he's been tweeting at them for a long time. You guys have completely messed up the map on this. You're, there's no way you can make these projections and you're leading us into like economic despair at the very least. And so then when George Floyd was murdered and they came out and said they were going to start modeling racism as a public health issue, he was like, you guys just did something that was hugely racist. Lockdown quarantine is a tool of segregation that disproportionately impacts minority and sort of marginalized populations in any time period, in any place. How in the world or why would we trust you to be an authority on racism? This is nuts. Nobody, nobody looked into where that quote was from. All you had to do was put it in Google and that article, the journal, and it's a medical journal article, right? Right. Right up. But so he hired a PR firm and they told him to resign and apologize and kind of hope to hope it blows over. And I was saying to him, I think that I'm not a PR person. That sounds like terrible advice because you're essentially admitting to what you are being accused of. And I think people would understand if you explained it, but it became such a groundswell. And I think by the time that everything hit, there were also a lot of sort of sharks in the water and a lot, and writing the books, a lot of this is documented in the book, but there were people who were trying to actively devalue the business using these sort of social platforms and influencers and stirring the pot so that they could buy Crosser for 50 million. We obviously sold it for 200 million. He could have sold it for more. And so he's called a racist. I'm telling him, I think you're getting bad PR advice. He's saying, can you please come and help me? And I'm saying no, because if I do that, then I can't go, you can't go do PR and then ever go back and get a job in a newsroom. That you'd be dead, right? Right. And like ethically, that would feel really weird. Um, And, and then on the other hand, I have my editor saying, you need to write about how he's a racist in this long form story on the NSCA case. And I'm like, well, no, he's not a racist. Maybe I should write a piece about why he's not a racist. And she's like, well, if you do that, then we won't be able to run the NSCA case. So there's all these con- like sort of conflicts coming up, both for me and obviously for him. And so then the allegations really escalated to this, the charge of toxic workplace and then sexual harassment. And I think by that point, I was like, this is insanity, right? This man is not a racist. Clearly, everybody's that's already been just assumed to be true. But he also, I've been out with Greg many times and he's never been inappropriate with me. And I know that doesn't mean that he's never been inappropriate with anybody, but I was friendly at that point with a lot of the women who were on the executive team and I checked in with them and they also said, I don't know where this is coming from. And so I sort of felt this is really, this feels to me like a smear campaign for some larger reason. And in my conscience, I can't sit on the sidelines and watch him be taken down for something he didn't do because he was a friend and because I think he's somebody who has done so much good in the world that we need him. And then also because I felt like the media was really starting to shift in ways that I didn't like. And I felt, what if we start as we, as the media start getting these stories wrong, it does such a massive disservice to the real victims that we need to just hold on for a second, do some real investigating, which I'm trained very well to do and figure out what is going on. Because at that point, I mean, the Me Too movement had gotten to be so popular that basically nobody was fact-checking any. And it's really hard to prove a negative. I mean, it's hard to prove somebody didn't do something, right? It's really easy to say somebody did something. It's not easy to say somebody didn't do something. Prove it. And so to Greg's credit, I mean, I basically was like, okay, I can't not help you. So let's do this. But you are going to have to give me everything. I want all your phone record. I want all your photographs. I want all your credit card transactions. I'm going to do a deep dive investigation. You can't hide anything from me. And to his credit, he gave me everything I asked for and never asked. And and I also said to him, I need to have access to everybody on your team. And I need to be able to tell them that I'm not reporting back to you. And you can't ask me what anybody said. And he never, still to this day, he has never asked for any of that information. And I think in large part, because he, I mean, he knew he was innocent and he wanted me to do whatever I could to get the information I needed to, to make that true. And so, or make that known. And so that's what we did. And I was able, I mean, I've written for the New York Times. So I got on the phone with them because they were, they were literally writing a piece the next day and the PR guy had canceled on the reporter twice 
She was on a family vacation and I couldn't be like, give me a day to get up to speed. She wasn't with me anymore. Right. And so when I spoke to her, I basically said, look, I don't know how to do PR. This is not my thing, but I know how to investigate somebody. And you can look at my track record and see that I've been a well-established journalist for a long time. So you're going to have to run your piece tomorrow. I'm going to tell you you're being misled. But I also want us to work together because there's more pieces. This is obviously escalating. It's coming from somewhere. So you need to share with me as much information as you can. And I know you're going to be limited. But whatever you give me, I'm going to use to find verifiable information and verifiable meaning like from a third party. So like photographs, and credit cards, those kinds of things that you can forensically check and make sure that they haven't been doctored in some way. So she, to her credit, she and I worked together on the other stuff and she realized that this was like absolute bullshit. It got harder when it got to other media outlets that don't have that sort of level of care, I guess is the word, a nice word to use, because they just want to run stuff. And so there were some that were really tricky. And there was one, in fact, there was a reporter who just wouldn't drop it. And I was sort of like, I've shown you that the sources are lying to you, which rule number one in journalism is that the source lies to you. You don't use it again. And I've proven to you that like Greg wasn't in that state at that time. Like what, where, where is this coming from? And I called another friend of mine who's in magazine and he said, and this is something else. This is because the magazine just settled a sexual harassment lawsuit. And part of the settlement is that they have to report on three stories of sexual harassment. So he's filling a legal quota, essentially, which is why his editors won't let him drop it. And he did eventually drop it because it was like he didn't want to put his name on there. So we got through that and Rosa came into the picture and we sort of helped with the process of the sale. And I had done a lot of training in Harvard Law School and negotiation, mediation, and had worked in high stakes environments outside of journalism as well as in journalism. And so I was pretty comfortable in that situation. And I think he was very grateful that I was able to help him. But I also think all of the common interests that we had had about health and science and what's going wrong and corruption really came to a different level of, of friendship and intimacy with the level of openness and trust that he gave me and I think his most vulnerable point in time and so I think it really bonded us together and then he was like sort of liberated in the sense that I think CrossFit had become too big for him I think there was so much sort of like political fighting I think the executive team was really tough to manage and I don't think he was really enjoying it anymore and I think he had been kind of create I mean even through COVID he kind of had this plan to scale way back and have everybody who was working basically running seminars and they were going to get through it. And I think he was excited about that because honestly, I think that's what he missed. I think he missed the like sort of boots on the ground. Let's meet with affiliate. Like he loved the Zoom. He did Zoom calls like all day for many weeks where he was just checking in with affiliate owners. And he said to me multiple times, those Zoom calls were awesome. It was so great to be able to actually talk to all the affiliate owners. I hadn't been able, I hadn't been that connected to community in so long. And I think he was missing that. And so I don't think he was loving running CrossFit at the end. And I think the game stuff was really hard on him and he didn't have a remedy for how he was going to, they were spent, he was spending $10 million a year as a loss on the games. Couldn't just cancel it and had tried to sell it and several, nobody wanted to buy without the education and the affiliate. And so he was kind of stuck. So I think as much as he said he would never sell the company when there was this sort of internal Lord of the Flies stuff going on at the end. And he felt like he had to just double down and like really protect Maggie and the kids. It also gave him a sense of, what do I want to do? I actually just gave this talk at a medical convention in Texas. And one of the things that I said was when I help people, so I now have helped other people who've been canceled too. And one of the things that's really interesting is that these are all really high level people, right? So they're like very well known. Their life is ripped out from underneath them, usually within a matter of 36 hours. Like everything that they thought that they knew and they had from their friends to their financial future to their businesses is called into serious question. And so they kind of rock bottom out. And what I often say to them is we have to make a list of things that are in your control and things that aren't in your control. And you need to focus exclusively on what's in your control and let me worry about the other stuff. 
And what always happens is that I also say like, there's something in this space. It's like a liminal space where we're in between and there's going to be an opportunity. But if you don't stick your head in the sand and you keep your eyes open, something is going to pop up that you cannot predict that will make you better off. So if you were here and then you went to here, you'll be here when we're done. And then with everybody I've helped, that's happened. And I have to say, it's because I think all of these really high performing people have an idea in their head. There's something that they want to do, whether it's a return to how they got started or it's people they want to be around or ideas that they've been sort of wanting to focus on, but they haven't had the mental bandwidth to do it. They're, they're free to do it and they're free to do it however they want without like advisors and investors or audiences, like you're worried about what they're going to think or lots of employees that you're trying to take care of or you feel protective of. And so I think for Greg, that really was let's, and he, I remember him saying to me, let's look at the philosophy of science. And I remember being like, okay, you're in Wyoming, your friend, your only friend right now is the moose in the backyard. Right. That, like I, we're going to look into the philosophy of science. He was absolutely right. So we did this deep dive into the philosophy of science and we, for me, it was like a luxury, right? Like somebody's paying me to just read and talk about really tough, tricky ideas. And I mean, I think because Greg and I have a very independent, respectful relationship of each other, we can, it's easy for me to say to him, no, you don't get that. That's not how I interpret it at all. We have to, let's read it again and try and figure it out. And likewise, a lot of the math stuff, I don't want to touch because it's not my area of expertise. And he'll break it down for me and he'll do diagrams and all kinds of stuff to help me understand the math. So we've really worked very well together over the last four years trying to figure out what is the root cause of these problems? Not peer review. It's not, I mean, the replication crisis and COVID, there are all these things that people will point to. It's not policy. It is really in the in the philosophy of science that we took this turn for the worse. And I think we understand that now really well. And so like when we're offering things like we have this medical society that we're launching, a huge part of it is educating people because a lot of the people that we've met with over the last four years are, have been like, yeah, we have to change policy or yeah, peer review is broken. We need to create a new peer review system or things like the Supreme Court case, the Dalbert case, which is what sort of defines what science is. And it, the definition is a consensus-based decision. That's wrong too. So I think we have an awareness about all this stuff. There's a lot of people in the country right now who are looking at these problems, but they're, I would say they're all focusing on symptoms where like we have really gone because we've had the luxury of time and both have been working on these problems for a long time uh, to know that it's actually much deeper than that. And I think you can't really fix anything until you understand what happened and how it happened and why. So, I mean, I think with medical society, it really is like a return to CrossFit health. And we've been just basically working on it in the background for a couple of years because Greg's non-compete is up in August, but the new owners, when they negotiated the deal, we created a carve out for him that said he could work in health. And I mean, that's pretty revealing if you want to get into right. CrossFit stuff. Like they bought CrossFit and didn't know that it was a health company. Right. He's been allowed to work in health for like been gone. And so this is coming to fruition because I think the doctors are sort of the tips here. And so sort of how Greg went for the SEALs and the you know, military at large when he launched CrossFit, knowing that it was going to benefit everybody, but that those guys would get it and they'd build credibility around it. I think that's how we feel about the doctors. Well, let's be fair. I don't, I don't think they knew what they were buying to begin with no. <laughs> when they bought it. Not fully. I mean, I think they had a sense of what they wanted it to be wow. and what they found out it was are two wildly different things. Right. For sure. Your perspective on all this is really fascinating to me. I clearly don't have anywhere near the experience with Greg personally that you do, but I've met him a couple of times. He's been incredibly kind to me. And what you're describing of that era was something I kind of had in my mind at the time. Like the very first time I met him, literally the first sentence out of his mouth was, I don't like the CrossFit games, which blew my mind as a, a young meme Lord and, and someone who really loved the games to hear the guy that founded the company didn't love that arm of the business. And as I had a chance to meet him and, and go out to headquarters and see what they were working on, I had the sense that he wasn't in love with CrossFit, the business. 
but he was intimately in love with CrossFit health and the medical side of it. And so I, I was, I wondered then if that's what CrossFit was going to become. And then we had, we don't need to relitigate it here, but we had the whole Floyd 19 thing and it turned into everything you described. And I wonder, and I guess I, I'll ask your opinion on this. Do you think we would have ended up where we are now, assuming all that hadn't happened? Do you think we'd be here now still like Greg away from the business, doing something he adores and loves and, and away from CrossFit or would he have stuck with it? Oh no. I mean, I don't think he ever would have sold. Never. I mean, I think he's really clear about that. He had no plans to ever sell. I, I don't mean sell the business necessarily as much as transform the business. Like I, I never, I never envisioned him selling it, but I wondered if it was going to become CrossFit health, the business, and that was going to be the business of CrossFit. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some confusion around that. I think he would say CrossFit health was a return to what, why he started. So, I mean, I remember going into boxes with him in Boston and he would tell me this happened all the time where people would be like, oh my God, like coach, it's so great to have you here, but I'm sorry. I'm not sending anybody to the games. And he would say, I don't care. That is not what this is about at all. This is about, and then he'd say like, how many people have you gotten a hundred pounds off of? And they would say, oh, well, Emily over there and Johnny over here. And, and he was like, that's why I'm doing this. And so I think, I don't think he hated the games. And I think he had a lot of respect for, does still have a lot of respect for Dave. I think the games became something that he had not foreseen. I think the idea of finding the fittest person on earth was cool. And it was like, it, I mean, I think he did enjoy inviting professional athletes to come and having them lose to the CrossFit athletes, proving the methodology was actually more effective than any other training regimen. But I think the, the success of it led to a branding problem that was prohibiting his real goal from coming to fruition, which was to help everybody prevent and reverse chronic disease. That's what he thought. He knew CrossFit could do that. He knew the world needed that. So it's, he has a solution. The world is demanding a fix to this problem. All he has to do is match those th things together. And I think one of the traits that he and I talk a lot about sharing is social engineering, bringing the right people together, figuring out what group and how they operate and the sort of psychological machination that goes into motivating and delivering on things or conflicts or whatever. So I think that was very frustrating. I think as somebody who really thinks of themselves as a social engineer to have a solution to a problem that a lot of people need and not being able to get those two together. And I think he blamed the games. I mean, I think he blamed the athletes not like becoming these mega celebrities who are eating tons of sugar drove him crazy and not hanging out in affiliate not supporting the community. I think all of that really bothered him. I think he felt like the job of CrossFit is to, to save lives. And this is not doing it. It's not inspiring people. And I think that I get a lot of pushback for that all the time. People are like, oh, I, after I watched the games, that was what inspired me to go into an affiliate. So I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but I think if you look at people who are really in dire straits in their health, I don't think watching the games makes them think like, I can do that, right? I mean, even for me, I feel like I watch the games and it's the adaptive athletes that are the ones that really make me emotional. And also when I feel like not working out, they're the ones who I think, Jesus Christ, that guy has no legs and he's doing this. What is my excuse? Like that, that inspired me a lot. But the super athletes, I think it's really cool. And I think they're beautiful. And I think there's a lot, you know, of entertainment value and all of that, but I don't think that that's what Greg thought his mission was. So I think that became a real conflict. And I think because he loves Dave and they have a really nice relationship, I mean, it's tumultuous at times, but I think a lot of respect between them. He didn't know, like, how can I do this and not ruin this thing that he loves, that he's created? I mean, Dave is responsible for the game. I think that was a huge conflict. How do I, what is the remedy? And so I think, would we be here? I think there would, CrossFit Health was gaining a lot of momentum, right? And I don't think they had proved it to be a business concept because every, they weren't charging for anything, but I think he would have kept pushing out that content, right? Like the, the old TVs, the like living room set. Right. And I think that was working. And so I think we would have seen the, he would have gotten to where he is now. It would have taken a little longer 
because he wouldn't have had the, you know, mental space to do it. But I think I can't imagine that he wouldn't have gotten here on his own eventually. Do you know what I mean? I just think yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. it was yeah, too, completely. too important to him. I mean, it's like, it's his life's work. And so I don't think he would have, I don't think he ever would have, but I think he would have restructured the company more and more towards this work. You know, it's interesting. I catch he, just like you do, I have the exact same opinion about the games or a very similar opinion that I, I don't personally think as many people find CrossFit through the games as we think do. I certainly didn't. And I, I don't know a lot of people that did, although I know some do. I think lately it feels less inspirational to me to see what has become strictly a professional sport, which I appreciate the fact that it's become that. But to your point, they're no longer in affiliates. Like that was the beauty of, of regionals. I also think, like I said to Dave, I think that they should require blood tests. Like you're the fittest on earth. What's your A1C? What's your CRP? Let's go in on inside. That might inspire them to actually change their diet, right? Because a lot of them are probably pre-diabetic. And you can be pre-diabetic and be an incredible athlete, right? Sammy Ingram yep. started Verda was world triathlete, type two diabetes. Like it's not, you're not, it's, and that's CrossFit. You cannot out work out more and fix your diet based on the pyramid. So I, I don't know. I mean, like I, Daniel Brandon's documentary, I like didn't plan to watch it. And then I watched a little bit and I got sucked into it. And I was like, that's a great story. That's a great story. Yes. The facing impossible odds and using CrossFit as a tool to overcome all kinds of hardship. And so I think I can't say that I'm not inspired by the athlete. Right. It doesn't inspire me to work out more. Right. Like that. Right. But I think that they're, they're doing incredible things and they deserve a lot of respect for that. I just think it's not, it's not necessarily a driver into the affiliate the way that it could. I think people hoped it would have been. If that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I think it could be if used properly. That's the kind of my big concern with the games. I, I don't feel they use it as they could to drive people to the affiliates. To your point about the blood test, like I'd never really considered that, but that's a great example of one. Of not only are we the fittest on earth, we're the, we're physically, we are physically the fittest on earth inside and out, proving, helping people see the journey some of these athletes have taken. People didn't talk, they don't talk about it much, but there are plenty of these athletes that have lost a hundred pounds and now are competing. And, and those stories don't get told because they're not on the podium mm -hmm. necessarily, but they're out there and it, I, it feels a real missed opportunity to talk about what CrossFit really does, which is transform lives, not just teach you to be great at rope climbs. Yeah. And I mean, I think again, it's sort of like, what are you deciding to pay attention to? Right. And so I think if the media is all centered on the, the top performers, that's, that's all that's worth celebrating. And that's great. And I'm not saying don't do that, but I think you got to do both. If you want your message to be like, this is actually for anyone, anyone who's willing to work hard enough can do this, then tell those stories. And I think that's where there's seems to be a disconnect. There are moments where they're trying. I mean, I want to give them credit. I thought they did a nice job at the games telling Dale's story and, and the work they're doing down at, in Portsmouth. And, and they told it a lot. I would have liked to have seen it more. I mean, <laughs> they, I like, definitely don't agree. No? I, in what way? That movie was like a CrossFit commercial. His documentary is like a big ad for CrossFit. Yeah, absolutely. Same. Like next to nothing to promote that. I don't know if they ever sent it out in an email to everybody. It was, I mean, there were a lot of opportunities they could have helped. They could have helped him get more media. Sure. I, and that was odd to me because I was... Well, I just meant at, at the games itself. Like I just, I was sitting in the Coliseum and they, they kept playing it on the Jumbotron over and over. And I was watching and thinking, man, how powerful this is for me. 10,000 affiliate owners or however many are in the room getting to see it. And like I was sitting, I know Dale and I'm sitting there getting emotional going, man, I'm not doing enough. Like I'm not working hard enough. He's out working me. I got to go do something. I understand your point. I mean, I, and I do agree with that, that I would have loved to have seen them put Dale up on his show on their shoulders and, and yeah, I mean, I wasn't meaning just to stay at the game. I mean, I think like in general, that would, right. that I sent that movie to a lot of people outside of the CrossFit space who have been like, oh my God, like I want to, I want to do CrossFit. This is amazing for mental health and for all kinds of reasons. Right. Yeah. And so 
I think it was a lost opportunity in that like they should have done a huge campaign around. I mean, it, yeah. Gail did all the work, beautifully shot. The stories are captivating, incredibly emotional, and it inspires people. Why would you not promote the fuck out of that? Like I would have, anyway. We, we know why they're not promote. They don't promote semis. Why are they going to promote him? I mean, let's be honest. They're trying. They're in expense cutting mode. And every time you have to promote something, you got to spend money. Like it's kind of that simple. But at least, at least that's what the banker in me says. I'm sure there are probably other reasons too. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of way to promote stuff like that that doesn't cost money, right? Like they have the audio. They could have run the trailer on their YouTube channel. It doesn't cost any money. It would have made them money. Probably right. like could have sent an email out to everybody. It doesn't cost any money. Like they could have put it on .com. They could have interviewed Dale on .com, right? They're, that would none of that cost. Money. Yeah, I think I'll speculate because I don't know this for a fact. But you mentioned it earlier, and some of Greg's frustrations. You mentioned how hard it was to manage the executive team and kind of the interpersonal dynamics of of running headquarters. And I'm not sure that's ever gone away. It sounds like it's actually gotten worse from at least what I hear from people. And I, I'm sure that contributes. I mean, as someone who runs a business, I know like you don't have everyone on board getting something like in this case promoted, not going to happen because of politics. People were just like, no, don't want to do that. Sorry. Got my own agenda. It's unfortunate. It really is. The, uh, the work you're doing with broken science. I wanted to spend some time on that because I keep seeing I mean, you guys are obviously doing so much stuff, but I, I'm not sure that the community at large has a clear vision of, of what the agenda is or what you're working toward maybe is the best way to put it. When you think of broken science and what you and Greg are trying to put together, like what, what is the stated goal? I mean, I think privately the stated goal is to help encourage more critical thinking in our society. I think we both feel like science is the empirical branch of knowledge. So it should be in its purest sense kind of untouchable, right? This is like where we find truth. Obviously, we don't think you ever find truth. You're always looking and it's about uncertainty and being comfortable with uncertainty. But I think ultimately, if the scientific branch of knowledge has been corrupted to this level, there is nothing that has been touched, right? There's nothing that's not corrupt. And so if once you make science subjective, the population becomes pretty vulnerable. And so I think our goal is to really teach people about how to look at the world in a way that allows you to make better decisions for yourself and your family. So I like to say that broken science is to the mind what CrossFit was to the body. It's going to take some work. You're going to have to sort of dive in and learn the math and learn, you know, statistical manipulation is really, we don't understand what they're doing. So one of the things we're doing for the medical society is called the Journal Club. And basically we're taking studies apart. So, and that will be part of a resource library for everybody. But you may, like the first study is a hallmark study on exercise and aging, and it's a longevity study. And the hope is that you go in and you read it. And Bob, my husband, who's a big medical researcher, was the head of research for Peter Atia, did all the research for Outlive and the Drive podcast and Peter's concierge practice. This is what he does. And so he's going to get on a, basically a Zoom call with anybody who signs up. And he's going to go through the study and he's going to explain what they're saying. This is what their objectives were. This is what the data shows. And these are the ways that they're tricking you to think it's something that it's not. So that you learn a lot about that study. So if you're into exercise, it's a great way to learn, like, how do you test subjects to make things determinate? But also you'll leave. And then if you want to go and read, whether it's a news story or a journal, a medical journal article, you're going to be informed as to what am I looking for? And what are the criteria that actually tell me what I need to know? I've been doing tons of explainer videos that are on our YouTube channel that break down medical tests or break down different things that I think patients should know when they go to the doctor so that you can ask questions of your doctor. I mean, I think when you go to the doctor, it's one of the most vulnerable inflection points in life, right? You feel scared. You, you don't really know how to advocate for yourself, but there's all kinds of things that you can ask that will actually, I think, sort of put aside the fear and allow you to feel like you're able to chart your own course. And quite frankly, you have to at this stage of the game, because otherwise you get put on a conveyor belt. Doctors are incentivized to prescribe medication and send you to more referrals. It sucks, but it's true. And when I just gave this big talk in Texas, one of the things I said to all these doctors was, I want to remind you all, you are the only one with any moral responsibility in the game. Pharmaceuticals are not under any moral obligation. 
to treat patients. They are under a moral obligation to deliver a return to their investors, as are hospitals, right? As are academic institutions. You're the gatekeeper. So if you don't take this stuff seriously, there is no hope for me and my children. This is not a joke, right? And patients have to be at the forefront of all of this. So I think for broken science, it's a huge amount of education. So we're breaking this into cohort. It's going to be an education society that's launching right before the end of the year. There's a personal health society that's launching in August, September. And then there is the medical society that we just launched last week. And the medical society is for doctors primarily, but it's also for nurses and chiropractors and researchers and people who are curious and want to know more. And really, I think Greg and I are both pretty open source people. And they'll, this, we're not going to hoard knowledge that could protect you against vulnerabilities that we know and we've identified are lurking everywhere. And it's sort of like this idea of having no hope for these systemic changes. I do have a lot of hope for the individual. And I think the individual can arm themselves. And I, I mean, I love how like you watch a group of moms get together and that they'll change the world. You can't do that if you don't understand. So the goal of the Broken Science Initiative is to call out these things and expose them. So we have a newsletter that comes out uh, every Wednesday, and there's always one original recorded piece. And then there's one curated piece that we pick from the news cycle that week that we think is really good to highlight. So it's also a source of news and information for you on all kinds of topics, right? So we have had Malcolm Kendrick do a whole series for what placebo and how do you understand these things? Russell Berger, who used to be working at CrossFit and did a lot of the yep. investigative stuff in Tennessee. He's writing for us and he's exposed to a lot of stuff. We had a big scandal at Dana-Farber where they were manipulating images. They were copying and pasting images from day one of a trial and pasting them into later in an intervention group to make it look as though tumors hadn't grown. And that just happened. And the mainstream media covered it for a week and then dropped it. We're still covering it. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that that I think should appeal to a wide audience. I mean, the people that I was talking to in Texas are not CrossFit doctors, right? They're integrative medicine doctors mostly. But the conference was about leaving your system and starting your own private practice. And so it was more like business advice. I was really the only person there who was talking about medical research. But it also, we've, we redesigned the website, I don't know, six months ago. And we did that in part because I was realizing like this, some of this material is really intimidating to me. So we've created summaries of every article and we went to great length to rewrite the articles so that they're at an eighth grade level and then a 10th grade level so that anybody can come in and access the information for free and educate themselves as much or as little as they want. And me and Ethan, who do all my tech stuff, Mia has been with me for years. She's probably the best programmer in the country. And they've designed a personalized AI that goes in and it learns what level you're at. And it learns where you stop reading and it learns what your interests are. So if you're interested in fitness, we have all of, I don't know if, but they took down all of the PDFs of the journal. Right. We have all of them. And the AI will see that you're reading those. And so it'll start recommending in your feed all kinds of other stuff that has to do with exercise physiology or nutrition or whatever. So it's really customized to help the individual user broaden their horizons in ways that they can handle in their, in their interest phase. We also, the back end of the site is like a social media site. So you can follow people, you can share research, you can form your own cohorts. So for the medical society in particular, I really want in the next year to have our own journal. And I want them to be networked so that they're empowered to do that. And when we launch the personal health society, there'll be a lot of patients that may be doing like an equal one type experiment. Doctors can link up with and they can say, hey guys, change your protocol a little bit and then we can study you and we publish it. So you can get around some of these systemic barriers to entry for research that may not be easy to do. Like IRB might not give you approval, but if I say I'm going to eat butter for a month and see what happens, cool. then I can do it on my own. So we're, I, I mean, I, my goal is just sort of take apart a lot of these systems that aren't working and provide an alternative. Yeah, when Greg was launching CrossFit Health, I had the impression, it actually was an impression, it was just through conversations that they were obviously building this, I'd call it a fleet of doctors that are going to, would spread the message and it would be connected to the affiliates because all these doctors were in our gyms working out. You obviously don't have that advantage 
through broken science of having mm -hmm. this fleet of 13,000 affiliates. But it sounds like you're taking a similar approach with the doctors. Am I understanding that right? Of trying to pull this together? How do you pull together the exercise piece of it? What do you mean? Well, I mean, like you had the affiliates before and now you don't. So I guess that's like, that was the advantage with CrossFit Health. You'd have all these doctors that would go back to the affiliates and then could pull members in to help understand what you're doing. And so trying to get your message out to kind of your target audience, I guess, is it's just a different task. For what yeah, you're doing. I think we still have the affiliates. I mean, I think a lot of the affiliates are still curious and loyal to Greg and want to know what he's up to. I think it, you know, I mean, I had hoped that we would be able to like work with the CrossFit Medical Society. That has become yeah. clearly tougher than I thought. Right. But I don't think that we, like we, we, we would tell anybody who was a doctor in our medical society that was trying to figure out how to reverse chronic disease, that there's a lot of places around the world doing this that you should check out. And I talked about CrossFit in my talk in Texas. We're not anti-CrossFit, despite what everybody, I mean, I like to separate these things. So I call the methodology, sure. the Glassman methodology now, and I call CrossFit. The and I think it's important to delineate those two, right? And I think I'm perfectly comfortable saying that the Glassman methodology reverses chronic illness and more people need to know that. And so I don't think, and I, I mean, I think, how do we build an audience? I think Greg and I are both good at, at, at generating interest, but I also don't think that this isn't this is part of what separates us from CrossFit right now. If we had 500 doctors in our society at the end of the year, I'd be thrilled. I think this is about delivering a high value product that allows them to really have ownership over the way that they're treating their patients and feeling good about it. I mean, Dr. Morale is at an all-time low. Suicide rates through the roof for doctors. I would love to re-empower doctors to heal and to treat and to prevent illness. So I don't need this to be, I don't need 15,000 doctors, right? I need right. doctors who are committed to this, who want to learn and contribute and have good conversations and support each other. That, it, that to me is much more important than like building a big business. Are you, are you, you mentioned it and I guess I'm curious now, do people, are you still having people viewing what you're doing as contentious? Like I know when CrossFit book came out, there was a lot of rumbling. Oh my God, is this going to be a tell all or is it going to be whatever? And, and as I started following you and getting to know you, it, for me, it felt anything but contentious toward CrossFit. Are you, are you still fighting that like kind of perception battle at all? Yeah. I mean, I don't think, I don't think CrossFit HQ, like anybody else messaging any, right. I don't think they're super open to anybody <laughs> talking about anything. So, but I mean, I think here's the truth, right? Greg was like prophetic in a way in educating people within the ecosystem on what he was doing versus what private equity or venture, ca venture capital would do. So I'm in a position where I have the rights to use all of his stuff. So he maintained the rights to anything that he wrote and all of his speaking engagement. So I have an archive of all of them. So it works out pretty well for me when they say, hey, go sell sneakers to pull a video of Greg saying, don't ever sell sneakers. Right. They don't like that, but it's not, I mean, for me, it's not reactionary. It's a reminder of, hey guys, remember you were warned about this stuff. Don't forget. And I think part of the reason that the price increase pissed off all the OGs, right? But I also think maybe they don't care because the OGs are the ones that were educated by Greg. And they're the, probably the biggest pains in the butts of, of HQ, right? Because they paid the least. They spoke out the most about changes and not liking them. And they wanted things a certain way. And these guys want to do it a different way. So sorry, you're not paying 500 bucks anymore. It wasn't just, that wasn't unintentional. I'd already get, right? I, would, I think it's like, let's cut those guys loose because they're a huge pain. They're holding us back and they're loud. And they're respected within the community. So if they're not affiliates anymore, we want to deal with them. Yeah, I can't speak to whether it was intentional, but I certainly understand what you're saying. I, I said at the time, I've talked to Dale about this, that for me, and I'm not, I don't consider myself one of those OGs because I have not owned an affiliate for that long, but I talked to Dale who has and several others. And for, for me, it was like, why would you jack up the price on 
the people within your organization that have literally have the most institutional knowledge more than anyone else. They know the ins and outs, like they know what you're delivering to saving lives more than anybody else does. And they're not going anywhere. Like, why would you do that? And you're, you're likely accurate that getting rid of the pain in the asses sometimes makes your business easier to run for sure. sure. I mean, Greg and I were talking about it just in terms of like our society, thinking about membership. And he was like, what would be kind of interesting is what if we charge like $15,000 or $10,000 and then every year it goes down. So eventually you're at zero, right? But you've proven that you've been there for that long and you're committed to the cost. And I was like, I love that. Like, that's a great idea. Yeah. It's not really like a sustainable in the way the standpoint, but from a perspective of, I mean, when I told him about the price increase, and I had been in, this is where we're different. He can look at it and have an immediate reaction that's very philosophical, where it's like, I need to crunch numbers and try to figure out like, what is going on here? Because I was, my hang up with the price increase was really about how the value right now is in the education. There's very little value in the affiliate. So if I were going to think about, like, we need more revenue, where am I going to get it from? I'm going to get it from the thing that actually is driving value, not the thing that's like kind of already on the chopping block or like people might be questioning, what am I getting from CrossFit and using the name? And so I was like, that's kind of an odd pick, right? Like I think if, people, if they raise the L1 by $1,000, it would be more money. And people wouldn't argue. The L1 is worth a lot of money. It's a, just an incredible education. Right. And so I was like processing all of these numbers of different scenarios of the best year for the L1, the best year for, and well, now they're requiring an L2. So like, how does that work out financially versus the price increase? And how can you get the same amount of money you're going to get from the price increase by changing things slightly? And also you raise money on the education certs and you're kind of just, you're dispersing the pain not just hitting the affiliate owner, it's hitting everybody. So you can raise it much less and make up the same amount of money. And so I sent Greg this crazy text message with all my numbers being like, hey, here's what I think. What, does this make any sense? This was this year, this was this year, whatever. And he just wrote back and he's like, honey, you're missing it. He's like, I would have paid the OGs to stay. He's like, this is, this is that's what it is. It's a lot, again, another lack of awareness around the importance of the role that they play in holding the community together and understanding the mission and getting other people committed to it. You pay, you'd pay those people to do that job, right. raise prices. And so, and he was right. And it was like, my math didn't matter. Right. Well, they're on the, they've got the business on the clock. They, they have a time frame in which they want to sell it. And they view the value of the business differently than you're describing it. I agree with you. The value is in methodology, the training, the education. That's, that's where the heart of what we do is. They view the value as the data. The data and the business are the members. You got three, three million active cross, active crossfitters, we think. And God knows how many that have come and gone over the last 20 years. You do the math on that of what that's worth to whoever wants to buy it. And it's in the, in the billions that they can sell to, mm -hmm. you know, well, that they can, they can mine that down. You know? I mean, I think that's the other thing a lot of people don't realize in having run different startups before and sold them. I know projections are huge. So if you can say as of today. We have 13,000 affiliates and they're all contractually obligated to pay $4,500. Very different than in a year from now when let's say a quarter of those are gone. And I think likewise, I think with the medical society, right? Like it's a licensing agreement. If CrossFit isn't investing any money in that. I think Tom and Jen are amazing. I have, would fully support what they're doing. I think it's important what they're doing. But I also think People should know they're doing all the work. Right. Right. And so it, this isn't a big investment CrossFit suddenly making. And it definitely pissed off my team when CrossFit and people were posting, like, we're continuing on with what Greg started with CrossFit Health. No, you're not. Greg would never have licensed out CrossFit Health to an affiliate to run. It would have been fair. It's too big of a job. You can't do that without any resources. 
And to expect them to do it all on their own and create this friction with us, like it's just, it seems doomed from the start. If we could have all worked together, I think, you know what, there might've been hope for them. But it, it's just that, I mean, it makes me upset. It makes me sad. It makes me feel really frustrated. And, and not just because that's not what Greg started. And right. so there was a lot of that language that made me think like they're acting as though like Greg is dead rather than Greg is still working. <laughs> right. Right. Like, Right. You didn't stop working. You want to follow in Greg, what Greg started at CrossFit Health, come to the Broken Science Initiative because we're working. He didn't stop, right? right? And Corin is now over there and Le Leaf is on our team. So like we, there's nobody left at CrossFit who worked in CrossFit Health. Amy's gone. So they got rid of everybody. And now they're saying like, we're continuing on. That's fair to Jen and it's not right. to Tom and it's not fair to Greg. It just is so fraudulent. Well, and I should disclose to anyone that sees this, Jen and Tom that we're talking about are my business partners at Sugar and Falls CrossFit, but it, also in full disclosure, I don't know what they're doing. I have purposefully not asked in any capacity because at one, I knew we were having this conversation and two, like I got the press release with everyone else. Like I didn't know it was coming until it happened. So it's like, all right, well, I'll wait. I'll wait and see how it plays out because I trust them. I mean, they're friends and so I trust them, but by the same token, I'm I was curious and was definitely scratching my head that this was something that was being farmed out and not actually run by CrossFit because I'm kind of looking at everything right now through the lens of who's the next buyer. And when you farm something out, that goes with it. It just does. And so it, it makes me start wondering, all right, do they know who the future buyer is? Is this part of that? Is it not part of that? Is it just, is it just an opportunity for CrossFit to say we're continuing Greg's work? You know, you know, I, I wonder, do you have any opinion on that whatsoever of, of those choices? Or is there a different choice that I'm missing of why they would launch this now, knowing they're likely going to sell within the next couple of years? I think they're terrified that Greg's non-compete is up, up very soon. And I think they are going to try and weave him into more and more stuff because it'll confuse people. I mean, this medical society announcement has confused a lot of people. I've heard from tons of doctors being like, wait, are you guys doing the same thing? Are you working with CrossFit? Is that a coincidence? Is that, I mean, I don't know. I don't have the answer from anybody on the inside or anything like that. I just I think it's an odd, very odd that they use the same wording we used, that they announced the same week we had said we were going to announce. Feels people can make what they want of that. As far as selling, I think, the more revenue streams they can show to a potential buyer, again, like going back to that idea of projection, like we, healthcare is a major industry, right. major, right? I mean, pharma and healthcare spent more money lobbying Congress last year than any other industry, more than manufacturing, more than finance, more than anything. And they spent more on media. They've got money to spend. So if you can position this as a company that's a healthcare company, we're a an exercise regimen, and I'm sure they're going direct to consumer because that's Jenna's whole background, right? And right. just be running the show. Then yeah, you're, that's potentially enticing. I don't, I, ha I really don't know. And I, I mean, like sort of to your earlier point of what's the mission, <laughs> what's the objective? I'm not clear. It seems to change a lot. I don't think there is a, I don't know that anybody inside knows either. Right. So, I mean, I think the other thing that about this medical society thing that was clear to me, that's really depressing is Nicole's the spokesperson for this and has been pushing it out hard. She doesn't have a budget to do this internally. That's not a good sign, right? I mean, this is, we started this conversation talking about how that was like Greg's core mission when he started. He felt the brand had run away from him. He was trying to get it back with CrossFit Health. If they announced like, you guys, you know what? This is a health company. We are really, we're going to double down on health education and reversing chronic disease. And this is what the brand is. I'd be like, okay, they realize something, but they haven't. They're just outsourcing right. to somebody else and not putting any investment in. And if Nicole can't demand funding for a project that's so important to her, what, like, that's not a good sign. Yeah, I get yelled at some, by somebody this week for saying these are two different business models. And I contend that I'm still right on this, but I'm going to describe it better here. Like what you're describing with a company that doesn't have a clear mission, they do have a clear mission. They just can't say it. Their clear mission is to drive revenue and cut expenses to sell. Like that's their clear mission. And so they can't do what Greg did so brilliantly 
which was, I joked on a podcast of the day when I asked Greg a, qu a question once, I got a 45 minute answer for one question. And I think I just said, how are you doing today? And he had his scripted answer and we started with John, I sit in possession of the speech, right? Mm -hmm. I sit in possession and, and it gives me this whole sermon about curing chronic disease and it was beautiful and brilliant. And every time I heard him speak, he gave that exact same speech. And I always thought to myself, man, clarity of message is so powerful. Even if you don't agree with it, you know where you're going, right? Like you didn't have to agree to say, well, I know we're going that direction, so let's do it. And I think that's, for me, that's my struggle with them. There's so many people there that I respect and love, but I can't seem to find the clarity of message other than we know we've got two or three years to fix the revenue stream problem. Yeah. And I mean, I think there are two things. One is that I don't think that it's the business's obligation to be fully transparent ever. Right. I mean, I think like, can hold the, they hold the cards. Greg was super clear. You pay me the affiliate fee and that's, you're getting the right to use the name. I'm not giving you any support. Right. I mean, legislate, litigate, educate. Yeah. Yes. Right. But that came in time that that wasn't always the case. And I think he felt when he came up with that, that he needed to be able to really justify why people were paying him that much money. And that he was, he didn't want to be in the business of telling you how to run your business, but he wanted to provide you with the support for things you couldn't do on your own, right? So like an affiliate's not going to be able to hire like the best New York litigator. Greg can't. He's not going to be, the best affiliate isn't going to be able to put together like the world's best training manual. Greg can't. So he wanted to provide the affiliate with things that the affiliate couldn't provide for themselves. And I think at the same time, what I don't like, and I have like almost zero tolerance for is lying. And I think there's been so much swappings, right? And so it's like when everybody was laid off, whatever that was a year ago in April, end of April, Don was like, we're not, that's it. We're done. We're not laying any more people up. They've laid off somebody like one person every month or every six weeks since then. That's not actually fair, right? So don't say we're not, we're done with layoffs and then just have it be like a slow bleed out. Right. And so there's things like that, that I feel like, you know what? Of course, nobody trusts you. You say one thing and then you do another. And so that makes it, I think that makes a lot of anxiety within the name. And I have people DMing me like all the time. And some, sometimes the messages are a little like crazy. Like people have theories about things, but they're angry about things. But I'm like, no, I'm, I don't have time for that. That's not at all of interest to me, but there is what, what I would say, the sort of culmination of some of that is an anxiety of when you don't have information, your mind goes to the worst case scenario. And the best way to calm that is to just be transparent about what's going on. And I mean, I think if they're trying to sell the company, I'm sorry, they are trying to sell the company, the timeline, we don't know. And maybe it's not appropriate for them to share that, but it's, this is such a different kind of community than other investment properties would be, right? That I think they have to pivot somehow and have some language around, of course, the trajectory is usually three to five years. We're at that point. Here's how we're going to let you all know when there's a sale. Like we cannot let you know. Right. I mean, there's that whole thing that came out where somebody said that Don was at a group and said that he, the company was for sale. And that was ridiculous. Like I was like, there's support Don. Right go to Europe and be like, hey guys, yeah, like we totally are for sale. That's not going to get, or can even be allowed to do that. And I think there's going to be NDAs and he's not going to be able to say anything. And so people need to like kind of rest with that and also make peace with the fact that this is going to sell and then it'll probably sell again in two years. And it's going to sell yeah. again in two years. This isn't, that, that's how it goes. And I feel like people get upset when I say that, but it's, it's not a pejorative, like it's not a negative. It's only a negative because you were used to something else. Right. I mean, I think the average gym is usually around for three years, five years, like it's not a long-term business. And one of Greg's goals was to make it sustainable. Professionalizing the personal trainer was his, that was everything. For the individual athlete, it was reversing chronic disease, but what he really wanted to do was put professional trainers on a level with healthcare providers. And part of that was allowing them to own and operate a business that they could stay at forever and make enough money to 
send their kids to college and own a house and have these other things, which he did, which is kind of unheard of, right? Like in a franchise, a lot of people don't understand the finances behind franchises. Like they take money off the top line. So if they take, let's say 5%, it doesn't matter if you broke even or you lost money that month, they're taking their 5% off the top. And to open like a Planet Fitness or another gym concept is 80 plus grand just to open. And then you're paying marketing fees of 10 grand a month per location. And those aren't marketing fees that are going to your location. They're going to a general fund that for the brand nationally. Like it's a totally different business model that Greg completely disrupted with the affiliate. No, you pay 500 bucks or you pay 3,500 and then that's it. I'm not taking any more fees from you. That's, and I mean, literally people at business that business school used to think that he was an idiot and they'd say, like, Mr. and it's wild that you're so successful just do, having done everything wrong. Right. No, his whole thing was like, this is the pie, right? And my slice of the pie is going to be like this, very small. And as the pie grows, so too will my percentage, not percentage, but my take home. Well, I don't get that revolutionary. I don't think the people running the company get it. It's, it's that whole thing you mentioned earlier about Don in Europe talking about selling the company. I knew that was complete and utter bullshit when I heard it for whatever that's worth. Cause he was on our show. Gosh, it was maybe six months ago and he gave us a timeline for the sale. And talk to us about, you know, what kind of money they have promised the board they need to put to the bottom line, like what kind of revenue they need to drive before they can sell. Like he laid it out for us. And so he was pretty transparent, but I think the, the trust factor that no one can seem to get past and why they can't get their messaging clear is when Eric came in, he sold this thing to everyone. Like he was the new owner and the savior and was going to be there with us to the end. And when he flamed out and the story of him buying it turned out to be wildly different, everybody started figuring out that, well, wait, Berkshire's really owns this thing. <laughs> like people started to get the details. Like once you break that trust down, it's really hard to get it back. Almost impossible. And I think Don has suffered from that. Unfortunately, I mean, I feel like he's a good dude. I like him and I feel like he's been honest with me, but I'm not sure he'll ever come back from the sins of what happened under Eric until they sell it. And then to your point, who knows how many times it sells after that. So it's, it's tough for all of us and they feel us to see that because we, we all want it to be successful and would love to have a greater vision of what's, where's it going to be five years from now, seven years from now, or 10 years from now. Cause we all want to be here 10 years from now, not three years from now. What's interesting is I studied revolution and I think there's something about founder led companies, right. And then CEOs that come in and try and, and take over. And it's similar in the sense of like the person who sparks the revolution is usually killed, right? Like they don't actually get to right. leave and everybody turns on them. And I think the person, the second person who comes in, who's supposed to be the knight in shining armor and the savior or whatever, also always flames out within short period of time. The third person who comes in, and I mean, we have to, Dave was CEO there for a little while, so we can figure we could play with all of that. Yep. But I think with this one, it's also, you kind of have to start with Eric because Dave and Greg both knew what they were doing. I mean, they knew what right. company was. And so I would guess that it's going to be your two CEOs away from people accepting the CEO and letting them lead. I, I think I like Don a lot. I've spent time with him. Like he and I have geeked out on text about tech censorship and other right. stuff not related to it. I don't, I think he's in a horrible position. I think he, I think he didn't know. There's no way he could have known what he was getting into or how he was going to be received. I think he's tried to do a lot of the right things. I think he's a good, I think he's very smart. I think he's well-intended. The fact that he didn't know that Greg non-compete was up in August, like nobody told you. Right. Like I would. It would be really hard for me if somebody made me the CEO of the company and then they were like, oh, hey, that guy everybody like thinks of as their guru could potentially start a rival business in right. like in that, two years after you start. Not a lot of time for you. And I think how long do does the average CEO last? For years. So it's not. And I know he said to people that he was planning this to stay with CrossFit forever and maybe he will if he can, but it's not his choice. So I don't think that, I, I also don't know that they would find anybody 
that would meet their criteria, right? So like Stanford MBA, who would be able to come in and lead this better than him. I think he's, yeah. I think he's a pretty, pretty good fit for what the community wanted and what they wanted and the melding of those. I think he's kind of perfect. Like the, whatever the headhunter was that found him understood the business well enough to know what she needed or he needed to satisfy. And I think he's pretty close to perfect, but I just like, I mean, Greg and I have a joke about after Rosa departed and then we saw him in a hotel bar at a, in the band, which was quite the experience that Greg will joke and he'll be like, tough shoes to fill. And it's like, yeah, it is buddy. It's tough sure. shoes. It's not, but I mean, who's out there talking about the methodology? Who's out there talking about the, the different levels of, of chronic disease reversal and how it works. I mean, think about the five buckets of death. Like Greg was in it because he built it and he, it was his, but he also was a trusted authority on all these topics that are hugely important from an educational standpoint. And I don't, nobody's doing that anymore. Well, it's damn near impossible to follow an inspirational leader. And, and the first time I met Greg, I said to someone afterwards, I'm like, I don't want to overstate it, but I'm really going to overstate it. I'm like, it's like meeting a Messiah. Like he just lights up the room. Like when you just walk in a room with somebody, you're like, holy shit, they are different than everyone else in the room. You don't have to talk to them to know. And that's what it was like. And so I, I wouldn't envy anyone that has to follow an inspirational leader that, that can give that clarity of vision. I think of, I love Apple as a, just as a product. Right. And I always love Steve Jobs because I, I, I know he was a kind of a cantankerous asshole most of the time, but the dude was a visionary. Like he, he would see something and just go do it. And they've never had anyone that's been able to replicate that. Their current CEO has shepherded it, but they're not innovating anymore. Yeah. It's just a different company. And that's where I feel CrossFit is heading. Like we're not innovating anymore. We're shepherding and we're not even shepherding it well completely. If we were just shepherding it, I'd probably be happier in most cases, but we're definitely not innovating. And, and I think that's the hardest part of following someone like Greg. He was always innovating, even if it was that ugly ass couch that people made fun of. Like, you know what I mean? Like that, when that thing came out, we're like, holy shit, what is he doing right now? But it was, he was innovating. From the front, right? It's, it's yeah. knowing again, sort of like knowing what the need is and knowing how to meet it. And and revving people up in the process so they're excited to go forward and do the hard work. And I think that is the inspirational part, but I also think like that, I don't, there's no voice that anymore. Yeah. It's, it's almost impossible to have to your point around when you are owned by PE and I, I'm not, I don't feel like private equity is the enemy. <laughs> I, I'm going to say that being in banking, but there's a huge difference between being the sole owner and working for somebody else. And I oh, think we're seeing it work. No way Greg could have done the things he did if he had a board of directors, right? Like they never would have let him sue the CDC. There's right. no way. And so I think that that's a great point. It's, it's, there's, we can't be that, whether you want to call it like rebellious or innovative or authoritative in the delivery of the methodology, if you have to ask permission. Agreed. Well, I, I just wanted to say, I appreciate that you guys are challenging the status quo. I don't feel like you guys are contingent to CrossFit, although I know you're fighting this battle some probably on the, on the inside, but I appreciate what you guys are. Is, I, I really do think it's, it's important to say this, which is that Greg loves the affiliates as much today as he always did, right? That hasn't changed for him at all. And when things are hard for them, it, it's hard on him. So, you know, it's sort of like a divorce. Thing, right where those are his kids and now there is somebody else has got them for the weekend and it's challenging but i also think there's a lot of love and there's a lot of wanting to do right and spread and so it's sort of like me saying i was hoping that we could all work together with the medical society why because the demand and the the risk of not satisfying that demand is more important than anything else and so we can rise to the occasion, but I think because they're focused exclusively on the financial outcome, they can't. And so for us, I would rather us be smaller and be really delivering the message 
and helping other people deliver the message and working with other people who are doing that, right? Like me speaking at this convention, then I would be, I mean, like, and you see this with lots of social movements where the infighting becomes the thing that destroys it. It's not because the, the movement wasn't powerful or wasn't necessary or people didn't want it. It's because this group started fighting with this group and then this group emerged right. the leaders from both and the whole thing falls apart. Like that, that's not the goal. We want to reverse chronic disease. We want to make more people aware of probability theory and help educate their kids and have autonomy over their own body and be able to live healthy lives. That's the goal, like full stop. So I think the, the fighting is stupid. It would have been much more in their interest to play nice because Greg and I are also not nice to fight. Right. Well, I think everyone knows that about Greg. I think they know that about you now, Emily. So that I'm a little scared of you. I'm not going to lie, but that's okay. I'll, oh. I'll get over it. So wait, let's <laughs> talk about you for a minute. I feel like you well, are fitting into this new show role. You're kind of taking on, it feels like you're taking on CrossFit a little bit more than you have in the past. Do you want to talk about any of that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's a controversial guest. First of all, I don't, I don't view you as controversial. This felt like symmetry to me. My first guest on kettlebells and cocktails, which at the time was called make pots great again, was Greg. He was my very first guest. And so it felt more appropriate than anything else to kind of continue that discussion. I don't view it as a pivot. I've always discussed cross we've discussed CrossFit HQ and had everyone from Don to Eric to JD Coons on the show and that sort of thing. I said this to someone on a show earlier today. Part of why I wanted to launch this is I wanted to be able to share opinions, like my own personal opinions that were unfettered and unfiltered and without fear of putting my co-host at risk. Nikki's a sideline reporter for the CrossFit game. She bleeds CrossFit. I wouldn't do, she's like a sister to me. I wouldn't do anything to harm her in a million years. And kettlebells and cocktails isn't the place for that. That's a family show. Like we talk about our kids and our life and her babies and, and talk to athletes. But I wanted an opportunity to talk about the things that are important to me. I want CrossFit to succeed. Like I really, really do. And I personally believe the more you bring up topics and debate them and get it out into the ether, right? Get people discussing it. You can shape the conversation. And my hope is if enough of us do this, when Berkshire came in, they had no idea what they were buying, right? No clue. They think they knew what they were buying, but they're, I guarantee you right now, they're like, holy shit. What is this madhouse we got ourselves into? I think enough of these conversations moving forward, the next buyer will pause and at least they'll know, which makes it better for us. At least they know what they're getting and they'll either tell us up front to go to hell or they'll make better decisions. One of the two, or maybe something in between, but either way, it won't be a shock. Mm -hmm. And that's my hope is can I sh help shape that conversation and help whoever the next buyer is to make a good decision so we don't get some nitwit again. Like, that's it. And I want to I want to be doing this 20 years from now, crossfitting, not podcasting, but uh, maybe podcasting too. But it, it fundamentally changed my life. It changed my dad's life. It's, I can, can give you dozens of examples of what I've personally seen it do for people. So if and the new owners are listening, what would you want them to know? The new owners? It, yeah, like prospective owners, let's say. Well, you're buying a madhouse. That's the first thing you need to know. Greg says that he sold the Hell's Angels to Costco. Yeah, and he did. He absolutely did. Yeah, we're all super opinionated. That's the, I think people figure that out pretty quickly. Well, I think we've talked about a lot of it on the show. I think the, the magic is in the affiliates. It's in the training and the methodology. I think you can't lose sight of that. You can't monetize the athletes, the everyday athletes like myself, like that's what they're going to want to do is to look at the dollars and cents of and go, okay, 3 million CrossFitters, they'll spend 4,000, $5,000 each and it's $15 billion done. That's what they're going to want to do. It's not a sustainable business. 
it sounds like it is because billions is a lot of money, but it just isn't like you want to continue to preach the, the methodology and to get our affiliates changing lives because they'll continue to grow forever that way. Here's a couple of examples. My dad started CrossFit at 75 because he had seen me do it for almost 10 years. And he goes, well, if my kid can do it, I can do it. And it quite literally saved his life. And my kids don't CrossFit, but they're active because they've seen me do it for a decade, over a decade of their lives. And their kids will be active because they're active. Like I've changed generations now. CrossFit has changed generations in my family. And it, I, I think it'll, it'll do that for everyone. So I, think, I hope the new buyers recognize that you said it earlier, you're not buying a, a fitness company, you're buying a health company. That's what we are at the core. We are a health company and they have to recognize that. And you got to look at it as more than the one thing people want to view us as, which is thrusters and pull-ups and run around shirtless and doing dumb shit. It's so much more than that. So I don't know. It's, it's almost, it's so complex. It's almost hard to verbalize. It's like a church They would call it a cult all the time, but it's, it's more like a church. You've got. You know, the investors asked me back a little while ago about something about how it's a tough business. And I was like, you need to watch Greg's talk at the, at Harvard Divinity School, because that holds a lot of the keys to what you're talking about. And they had him come speak because they thought CrossFit had all of these hallmarks of being a religion. And I think that that's absolutely right. I think it's much more akin to a religion or some sort of social charter like AA or something like that. It is a gimbus, right? Yeah. Somebody said to me the other day, they were like, CrossFitters are always fighting. Why are you guys so cantankerous? I'm like, have you ever been to a church? Because this is nothing. This is nothing compared to the infighting in a church. Like it's not even close, uh, but it, it is very similar. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that's part of it, right? Like you'll get into debate or argument or fight with people right. over something you really care about. If you don't, right. If you go to orange theory and you show up and like, there's somebody in your class who's annoying or they did something, the toilet paper is the kind you like, you're not going to mention it because you don't. Right. Care. I think the new owners need to realize that. Like right now, I said, that, I said this to Don, actually. He laughed at me, but I hope he believed me. Right now, they have shareholders and a few stockholders. Very few, right? I told him, no, you don't. You have 3 million stockholders. I'm a stockholder. I feel like I'm invested in this company. I mean, besides the fact I am technically invested, at least in an affiliate. I feel like I'm deeply invested in this company. And anyone that buys it needs to recognize you're going to have 3 million stockholders. Whether you take this company public or not, we all feel like it is. Yeah. We all, we all have an opinion and we're going to push back hard when you fuck it up. Yeah. And yeah. And that's so different than investing in a toy company or yeah. in something else. And so I think there is a reckoning that happens there. When you come on. And I think during the sale process, like Rosa was out, like I like to joke, he was like out with the game athletes without, with the shirt off taking pictures like he didn't spend any time with us right. trying to understand the business or like talk working with the lawyers to go through due diligence like he had zero interest in that i think he thought like he knew and maggie greg's wife came up <laughs> not very nice but it's perfect so i will share it which is that rosa bought crossfit to increase his online dating profile like that's it right that's what that was about and i think that wasn't a good start you know what I mean? That it didn't, those pictures don't age well, given the trajectory that he took the company on. So. Yeah. Whoever gets it next needs to spend time building trust and, and, and getting into the affiliates and seeing the work that's being done. And to your point, promoting it, like it would go a long way to promote Dale's work. You know, so others can see that people like to be recognized, but they need to see that the, that what we're all doing is working, not just our own little hamlets. Like it works everywhere is it works literally everywhere. I've yet to see an affiliate that doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, like you start with just transparency. Who are the owners? That would be. Yeah. Right. We can only dream. 
Right. Well, Emily, thank you for coming on. I, I, I know we covered a multitude of topics, but I think it was really important for people to hear your voice and what you're working on. And I'm excited for you guys. If there's anything I can do, let me know. I can't, can't think of any memes that would be funny for broken science, but I'll do my best if you need there's, them. Actually, I mean, like we could get into a whole thing on scientific misconduct and how ridiculous it is. I don't know if you saw that we posted this thing about a paper that got published and then flagged because it was all fake. And the images were all AI images and it's a mouse with these balls that are like gigantic made for me. I'll have to start sending you okay. stuff. But no, no I just appreciate it. And I feel like if people want, are interested in what Greg is up to, like they should go to brokenscience.org and just check it out or follow our YouTube channel. I mean, he's speaking a lot. We're doing a lot of events. We're sponsoring events. If people have events that they're looking for sponsors for, hit me up because I think we really are trying to build a community that's very similar to what he built with CrossFit. And so it's really grassroots about people who are want to follow a mission and want to make the world a little bit better tomorrow than it is today. So we're looking for people who are dedicated. I'm, I'm not interested in people who are trying to get famous. I'm interested in people who want to do some hard work. And I think we have right now, you can see like our last event, we pulled, I wanted to make it really inconvenient, but we did it on a Thursday afternoon. So miss work to come, like, how much do you really want to come? And we have a very long wait list and we only got through 250 people that we asked 10 days before the event on a Thursday of the afternoon, right. if they wanted to come by the time we were full. So we got more than 60 people off that list to come and it was great. And Greg was funny. He was like, I hope these aren't just people who are like, I want to be in Greg Glassman's living room. And was they actually were interested in. And they were. And it was a fabulous. And so I think we're going to do more of that kind of stuff. We have some medical society stuff coming up. And I want it to be, it's for doctors, but it also, as I said, it's for anybody who wants to be educated. And I think we learned in the last few years, especially, that you can be able to read the research for yourself. Do not trust the media telling you that Alzheimer's is caused by X because it's probably a corollary study. If you have questions about the statistical step or ideas for other explainer videos that I could do to help demystify some of this stuff, I love doing that. I don't love doing that, but I can do that. Right. And I think we're, we're really looking for people who want to change the world. Well, any, anything I can do to help, let me know. I have a much smaller platform now, but I think it'll be more impactful. We'll, we'll see you on there. Thank you for having me on. It means a lot to be your first guest. Anytime.